Welcome to the fourth and final of our 73rd Mellon Lectures featuring Anna DeVere Smith. And I hope you've been with us for the last three. And if you haven't, you're in for a treat. And if you have, you're in for another one. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so we're, we're thrilled that you're here with us. Also, I want to point out that a beautiful adaptation of Anna's first essay has appeared in today's Washington Post in the op-ed section. <laughs> Without further ado, I would like to bring out Anna DeVere Smith. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Kaywin Feldman, Stephen Nelson, Kyra Cabanas. Gary Calgano, Sarah Battle, Theo Pugh, Devin Harris, Rob Milgren, all of these individuals have helped me experience a unique form of hospitality. Would you help me thank them again? So uh, we'll be together today about an hour and um, 10. Is that okay? It, it depends on if, if you laugh at all. I do encourage you to laugh when you think it's funny. Uh, even if the person next to you doesn't think it's funny, it's okay. <laughs> chasing that which is not me, chasing that which is me. Me, number four of four lectures. Shout out of a canon, black female, in the 1970s. 1973, I was the least likely person to wind up in a conservatory full time for three years to study acting. My classmates pirouetted down the hallways of the school. They sang Broadway tunes as they strode up and down the hills of San Francisco where the school was situated. As for me, I had no idea that people actually studied acting in the way that was unfolding in front of me. I grew up with a kind of unspoken ambivalence about performers, Negro middle class hypervigilance about drawing bad attention, warned about being loud and colored, it was kind of confusing. There was also an inhibition that had to do with religion in my multi-generational family with widely variant ideas about God, Jesus, and sin. My maternal grandmother was an evangelical Christian and I was crazy about her. I never wanted to displease her in any way. Her niece, who everybody called Sweetheart, was about the same age as she was. They'd grown up like sisters. Sweetheart had left Baltimore and went to New York. Passed as Spanish, this must have been like in the 30s, 40s, became a chorus girl and was kept by a man. She left her daughter in Baltimore for my grandmother to take care of, who already had eight children. By the time I came into the world, Sweetheart had moved from New York to California. When she periodically returned to Baltimore in fur co coats and with different boyfriends, she was received like royalty. It was as if there was nothing transgressive about any of her behaviors. She was gorgeous, charming, and funny. She sparkled. As a child, I never said more than a shy hello to her before vanishing into another room. I listened from afar to the resonance of grown-ups drinking adult beverages and laughing loudly with their special guest. I had left Baltimore uh, with $80 in an overnight brag and headed to California looking for the revolution. This was 1971-72. The revolution was over on the East Coast. <laughs> And I thought that there may be some remnants of it on the West, but Nixon was president and that created a rather sobering reality all over the country. I made my way up the coast from San Diego, stopped in San Mateo County for a year, where just 30 miles away in San Jose, Angela Davis was being tried and was subsequently set free. I did not attend the trial. I was busy working at a drive-in movie theater until I landed a D 
decent job at a junior college with a very cool boss. He never sat behind his desk. He sat on a counter, jazz playing in the background, puffing on a skinny cigar, musing about the events of the day, giving my social justice bent some texture, and trying to talk me into going for a PhD. I continued north to San Francisco. <laughs> Sweetheart and Eddie, her third or fourth husband, picked me up at the Greyhound bus station on Market and 7th. As you know now, that's no man's land. At the time, it wasn't so bad. Eddie, Chinese American, was a former chef who spoiled us with delicious meals. His English appeared to be minimal, but it was hard to tell because Auntie, at 80 years old, was still gorgeous, still sparkling, and now was a full-fledged rock on tour. They rented out their basement apartment, and so the tenant had left, and I got it for $75. I don't even know if $75 could get you uh, $75 for a month. I don't even know if $75 uh, could get you public transportation for a month in San Francisco at this point. I came home from acting school one evening, and Sweetheart handed me a letter from Grandma, who by then had been overtaken by dementia. There was a $5 bill inside. The letter, in scrawled handwriting, contained only a few words. I hear you want to become an actress. Please don't take off your clothes. <laughs> Here's five dollars. Buy yourself a new dress. Love, Grandma. The most likely person to wind up at the conservatory had a mainline Philadelphia accent and deep, rich vocal resonance. She was about five foot, ten and a half, maybe five eleven, and everybody thought she looked like Katherine Hepburn. The only person who was not drawn to her looks, her voice, and her artiste personality was our acting teacher, who actually told her one day not to take her shoes off while performing scenes because her feet would, were too big. He would be fired now. She rushed into the cafe where I was to meet her and have a cheap night before the training year started dinner. She intoned with characteristic urgency, want to go up to the cathedral and hear Beethoven's Ninth? It's going to start in just a few minutes. So we bolted up five perpendicular blocks uh, on either Jones or Taylor Street in San Francisco to Grace Cathedral on Knob Hill. It took only the first two German words, the first human sound in Beethoven's Ninth, oh, oh, Freunde. My perpetual sense of non-belongingness, Freunden, was transformed into a sense of oneness. I was one with the chorus. I was one with the music. I was one with the human voice, I was one with it all. The next morning, my forehead was on fire. I asked Benita Bradley, our yoga teacher, can performance give you the flu? <laughs> this was decades before we began to believe that entering a performance space could cause you to get COVID. It was decades before we began to worry that entering a performance space charged with emotion as it usually is could be triggering. Benita offered assurance that there was no pathology in my reaction to the ode to joy. All was well with Beethoven and me. My chakras were opening. 1977, Squaw Valley, California, recently renamed Palisades Valley in the Sierras near Lake Tahoe, was the exquisite setting for the Squaw Valley community of writers, a week-long conference where wannabe writers like me enjoyed tutorials with big-shot poets, novelists, screenwriters, and directors. I was to connect with Stephen, who had been there before, at the bus station in Truckee. Truckee still had some dirt streets and wooden sidewalks. We were going to share a ride to the valley. I was very nervous. Stephen was that cute Lebanese-American poet with Buddha looks and hair as thick and curly as mine, sitting on a suitcase. His anticipatory grin promised destined friendship. Worn-out boots, cowboy hats, and ski bums with shades on the tops of their heads greeted me and Stephen when we got to the headquarters, a simple A-frame building with a huge wraparound porch, a pickup truck, kicked up dust coming across the field. Two handsome kids jumped out, 
bearing hammers, no doubt, to fix something on the porch, a perpetual activity, someone yelled, someone yelled out, look, a huge rainbow spread across the valley. Wow, nature's hospitality. Though the place was peppered with East Coast literati, Blair Fuller, who was one of the founders, had also been one of the people who started the Paris Review. But it, it, it did not have that literati feel. There was no need to genuflect to Frank Pearson, who had won the best screenplay Oscar for Dog Day Afternoon and been nominated for Cool Hand Luke. No hush fell when Sam Shepard ambled into the beat-up saloon. He swept a beer off the bar, made his way to the pool table, and that was that. Hierarchy is a friend of efficiency and necessary for those who need to make sure that everybody stays in their place. That's understandable if one is herding sheep <laughs> or cattle, but not so much if one is devoted to cultivating creativity. Creativity requires mobility and eased hierarchical structures. Hospitality is cut short by unrenovated hierarchies. I was in the hang on the wraparound porch with arriving writers, eclectic as they could be, when in the distance a car full of poet teachers swiftly crossed the field. It came to a smooth stop just in front of us. A rail-thin poet teacher stepped out. He looked like a monk who hadn't eaten in a month. His shirt was rumpled. He sported a bit of a cowlick on his thinning hair. But the guy had wattage. He really had presence. He presented a public reading that very day. I sat in the front row, nothing between us but a music stand. One of his poems was quite brief, but as with the ode, I had a physical reaction. The next morning, all of the muscles in my body were sore, as if I had just had a massive full-body workout or had been beat up. I've never been beaten up. The welcome cocktail party was thrown in a beautiful house by one of the patrons, no doubt, San Francisco old money. Because genuflection was not a part of the community etiquette, I walked right up to the rail-thin poet teacher and I told him that I'd woken up with aching muscles and I thought that his brief poem was the cause. His face lit up with surprise and curiosity. And then he said with a sense of satisfaction, that's because I wrote that poem as a curse against my ex-wife. The ode to joy had been full of good intentions. <laughs> Schiller's poem in English, joy, a spark of fire from heaven, daughter from Elysium, drunk with fire we dare to enter, holy one inside your throne. Your magic power binds together what we by custom wrench apart. All men will emerge as brothers where, we, where you rest your gentle wings, be embraced. All you millions share this kiss with all the world. The poet's poem was full of bad intentions. It was written to make somebody feel some pain. The power of language lives in meaning, sound, rhythm, and intention. That's why you can sever somebody's soul. when you tell them that they are worthless in your eyes. You can also mend a broken heart with how you say what you say with good intentions. What I just read were excerpts from a chapter that I wrote for Renee's Fleming, for Renee Fleming's anth anthology of essays, which has recently come out, Music and the Mind. While at acting school, I sought new forms, not for the sake of finding new forms, but because I felt there should be room for more people to be dramatized. <laughs> Thank you. At that time, the family of produced American dramatists was populated almost entirely by white, heterosexual, presenting males. Some kind of movement was afoot 
which recognized that increased opportunity for other voices was needed. In addition to more opportunity for artists to make work, I thought in our art form that we could benefit from fewer stereotypes, from greater particularity in the characters who lived on our stages. I also thought that the sonic life of the theater needed new intonations, new rhythms, new intentions, like bebop. When a bebop emerged on the jazz scene, when I became a teacher, I tried to enliven the languages spoken by my students, and I became utterly aware that people in real life did not talk like people on the pages of most plays, Sam Shepard at the time being an exception, which were written in part like prose. My grandfather had said that if you say a word often enough, it becomes you. I set out with a tape recorder to record unique voices, unique stories, unique intentions, to become America word for word. A tape recorder soon became my appendage. It was always an arm's length away. I would interview people around the country, especially in moments of disruption and discord. It was in those moments that the people spoke in very unique and sometimes profound ways as they tried to make sense out of disarray, tried to put together exploded fragments of assumptions that followed catastrophe. This required chasing that which was not me. It was a chase I knew I would never win. I called the overall project, which now includes about 18 plays, the first 12 never saw the light of day on major stages. All of this work is under the umbrella on the road, a search for American character. It's a search that would never end. It meant absorbing into my heart and soul, embodying the very words and breaths of people who were very different from me and with whom I did not agree. What did I learn after interviewing thousands of Americans? Most, in spite of what they may purport, do believe in the promise that you can make it if you try. Even rebellion is a sign that the fulfillment of the promise is expected. Why protest for fairness, equality, and dignity if you don't think that fairness can exist? During the first lecture in the series, I quoted a Martin E. K. poet, writer, and philosopher, Edouard Glisson. Quote, errantry, therefore, does not proceed from renunciation nor from frustration regarding a supposedly deteriorated situation of origin. Sometimes by taking up the problems of the other, it is possible to find oneself. The not me and the me are related, of course, and today my goal is to get to us. Fair warning. I won't explicitly get to us, as one of my Stanford undergrads <laughs> said when I taught there in the 1990s, loudly, mid-class, hey, everybody, I finally figured her out. She talks in stories. <laughs> to the stories. You know I'm telling the truth, Marcos, one of my former students. Let's go back to Brent. Bull rider Shoshone, Idaho, who some of you met in the first lecture. I showed you one of Diana Walker's photographs of Brent. Here's another. Brent. Brent Williams. I'm only going to do a tad, the tail end of what I performed on the first day of Brent. Toughness. Toughness, well, we's in West Jordan, Utah, and I had this bull shove my face right through the metal chutes. So my buddies drove me to the hospital, took like five hours to sew me up, and when they straightened out my nose, I had to be at a rodeo that night, and I really didn't want them to put me under anesthesia, however you say that word, and I told them to do it without it. And when they straighten out your nose, they shove these two rods up your nose and work their way up, and it straightens your nose all up, and it felt like it was shoving clear through to my brains, and it was going to come out the top of my head, and everybody saw it, and they said it should have killed me, and they didn't even knock me out. But I think I have a high tolerance for pain. <laughs> so I guess that'd be toughness, I guess. But once they did that, I could breathe, 
and I hadn't been able to breathe since I broke my nose in the high school rodeo. So that's just a smidgen of Brent. It was not until I was preparing for these lectures that the not me in Brent met the me. I started saying the words of Brent in 2003. How many times did I say, shove my face right through the metal chutes? But a month and a half ago, those words knocked on the door of my subconscious, and a memory came out. The first agent I ever met, all the way back in my last year of acting school in San Francisco, had a very hospitable-looking office designed to exude comfort and classiness, I barely sat down on the couch, and she said, in a British accent that I won't even try to do, I won't be able to send you out because you will antagonize my clients. Antagonize? I was very polite in those days. You don't look like anything. Will you go as black or white? Shove my face right through the metal chutes. <laughs> Those are the words of Shoshone Idaho Bull Rider. Now they're part of my mental autobiographical photo album. Like Brent, most of us in this room have to figure out how to approach the bull. think about it before we attempt to ride the bull. Sometimes we come out the other side of the shove, breathing than we did before. Sometimes we don't. Brent Williams, AKA <laughs> Bull Rider. 1978, 1975, I'm in my apartment on Amsterdam Avenue between 77th and 78th in New York City. I'm living gig by gig now because I chose to leave the very respectable and much sought after job that I had on a tenure track at an excellent university. I left to walk dogs and do whatever I needed to do, support my art making, free of junior faculty, all encompassing responsibilities. So I did walk dogs, I did work as a temp at J.C. Penney, and I did work in the complaint department at KLM Airlines, which actually became a very important part of my work, all those letters of complaint. Sunday morning on the radio, I hear two voices in a discussion. I'm drawn to the stark difference of the rhythm and their vocal patterns. Their intentions start to suggest the mildest bit of combat. I've never heard one of the voices before. The other one sounds vaguely familiar. I grab my tape recorder, only an arm's length away. I press record. The interview had actually originally taken place in 1959, 20 years earlier. Years later, I find a full recording. Here's, I'm just going to share five minutes of it. You'll, you'll know who everybody is once I start. It was like a 20-minute conversation. This is Mike Wallace with another television portrait in our gallery of interesting people. Our guest was an unknown, unpublished writer until early this year when her play Raisin in the Sun came to Broadway and was voted by the New York drama critics as the best play of the year, better than plays by Tennessee Williams, Archibald MacLeish, and Eugene O'Neill. And now to our story. One night, Lorraine Hansberry, a girl who had dabbled in writing, made a brash announcement to her husband. She was gonna sit down and write an honest and accurate drama about Negroes. Sansbury exceeded her own expectations, perhaps. Sansbury, first let me ask you this. As a heretofore unknown writer, a 28 or is it 29 year old girl, what was your reaction to that kind of a claim? Lorraine Hansbury. Well, I received it uh, happily. I felt that our piece was substantial and honest and um, the craft of it rather satisfies me. I think I would have liked it if I just walked in. John Chapman, the drama critic for the New York Daily News, wrote that he has great respect for your play, but he feels perhaps that part of the acclaim may be a sentimental reaction. An admirable gesture, I think, is the way that he put it to the fact that you are a Negro, and one of the few Negroes ever to have written a good Broadway play. 
I've um, heard this alluded to in other ways. I didn't see Mr. Chapman's piece. I would imagine that if I were given the award uh, because they wanted to give it to a Negro, it'd be the first time in the history of this country that anyone had ever gotten an award for being a Negro. <laughs> I don't think it's a very complimentary assessment of an honest piece of work or <laughs> his colleague's intent. Well, let me quote him. He said, if one sets aside the one unusual fact that it is a Negro work, a raisin in the sun becomes no more than a solid and enjoyable commercial play. Well, I've heard that said too, and I don't quite know what people mean. If they're trying to honestly analyze a play dramaturgically, there's no such assessment. You can't say that if you take away um, the American character of something, that it just becomes, you know, something else. Mm -hmm. The Negro character of these people is intrinsic to the play. It's important to it. It's a good play. It's good with that. Is it fair to say, even in proportion, very few Negroes have distinguished themselves as playwrights, novelists, and poets? There have been a few, including yourself, but not many. How come? Uh, to whether they've distinguished themselves uh, is a kind of difficult to discuss because we always have to keep in mind the circumstances and the framework that Negroes do, Negroes do anything in America, which is, of course is a hostile circumstance. We've been writing poetry since, you know, the 17th century in this country and publishing. Been writing plays that simply never see the light of day because the circumstance, as I say, is hostile. But that, and the same is not true uh, in the case of Negro athletes, Negro entertainers. Yes, well, I think in proportion, there are more of them who become hugely successful. Yes, of course, because one of the features of American racism is it has a particular place where it allows Negroes to express themselves. We're not very warm to the idea of Negro intellectual exploration of any kind in this country, we presume, or at least the racists do, not me, that it's all right to display physical or musical or other features like that. But don't, don't go writing and don't go trying to suggest that there's anything cerebral within our sphere, you see. We haven't had the benefit of enough Negro writers on Broadway to know what they will say about anything. Uh, there are any number of professional playwrights who simply don't get their scripts read by Broadway producers. I'd be the last person to say that it's because they write poorly. An awful lot of poor scripts get to Broadway. And, uh, <laughs> and so I don't think that's the reason why black playwrights' plays don't. Well, what is the reason that theirs don't? Racial discrimination in the industry, of course. Racial discrimination in the industry, of course. Lorraine Hansberry and Mike Wallace, 1959. The relationship to the gatekeepers and those who do not fit the picture gets more or less hospitable depending on, to use Miss Hansberry's word, circumstances. That recording was from 1959. 34 years later, in 1993, Toni Morrison will win the Nobel Prize. This will significantly open opportunities for many more black women writers and intellectuals. And rumor has it that she also helped a lot of artists get paid better because of what she was paid at a university after she won the prize. The canon out of which I was shot in the 1970s, which included magisterial works, of course, like Beethoven's Ninth, was lined with adamantine assumptions. Adamantine melts at 6,170 degrees Fahrenheit. My generation of playwrights certainly did their part to warm it up. I spoke about Nsuzaki Shange and Adrian Kennedy in my first lecture. Also, Tony Kushner, David Henry Wong, George C. George C. Wolfe, August Wilson, Susan Laurie Parks, John Leguizano. This list is not meant to be thorough, but just to give you an idea. Elizabeth Streb is a daredevil choreographer and a MacArthur awardee. Like me, she questioned assumptions about her art form. She left Tondu's behind and worked on defying gravity. We didn't know each other when we arrived in San Francisco at about exactly the same time. Her early work was as a cook. Mine was managing a snack bar of a drive-in movie theater. We were born the very same year, but that's where the similarity ends. 
She had ridden across country on a Honda 350, not really made for long hauls. I rode comfortably in the back of a car that two friends drove. Strab is one of my most colorful, colorful, colorful not me's. Auditions for her company are three days long, and they are constructed in such a way that no one ever gets sent away. They just self-eliminate. <laughs> they do not use the word pain. They call it an interesting something, oh, yeah, yeah, an interesting foreign sensation. And the following stills that you're going to see are from a documentary about Streb called Born to Fly, produced by Catherine Gund and Tanya, Sel Silverotnum, Tanya Silverotnum. So in these next stills, Elizabeth Streb is 62 years old, walking down the exterior of the City Hall in London. I'm scared to walk in the center in this building <laughs> because there's a pathway with no wall that overlooks the floor beneath. Me and Streb, not me. This is word for word of an interview I conducted of Streb. And this is called Fire Dance. I mean, one time I was on fire because I did a fire dance for my girlfriend and caught on fire accidentally. I use Sterno. I'm crazy, I use Sterno. This was a couple years ago and I wanted to make something for her 40th birthday that was really special for Laura, yeah. And so I thought of Blaze Away, where basically I'd start a fire and I'd fall on it and put it out. So I used Melissa, Melissa Etheridge song, went, cause I'm the only one who walk across the fire for you, ooh. So I made Laura stand at that end and I stood here and my dancers were lighting the fire, and I made her walk towards me. She had no idea what I was doing. And there were like a hundred people at the party, and I'd rehearsed it, I mean, so completely. And uh, I flew, you know, you fly, you go into a crouch, and at this certain moment, you fly. You fly into a flying horizontal X, and you land on, and I made the fire as big as this torso part, so that I would smush it. But big enough that you would see the fire, but not so big that it went outside my body. I would just smush the oxygen out of it. And I landed on it, and unbeknownst to me, I'd been rehearsing, and I had some sterno on my torso. So when I went like, boom, and like that, I looked down, and I go, oh, uh oh, I'm on fire, and oh, I smush it, and ah, oh, that's not going to happen. So I stood up, and I was literally on fire. And I mean, it was just like, then I went like this, and it was the fastest phenomenon I'd ever seen. I had never seen anything move that fast, be that fast, and you know, it was just like, okay, and this is seconds that were stretched, and like everyone in the room was looking at me like, oh my God, but nobody did anything. <laughs> because, yeah, isn't that effing crazy? Did nothing. And, and even my friend was continuing to take pictures. Danita, my friend. And I was like going, okay. And then I was sort of like going like this. I'm saying, well, that's not going to work. This sterno is going to burn because it went through my pants. This sterno is going to burn till it's gone, right? And the thing I was thinking was, it was, it was traveling up my body. And so if it got to my hair, and I was thinking, the thing I was thinking was, I would, Laura, I would ruin Laura's party because I'd be whisked away in an ambulance. So my dancers... They go, take it off! And Thierry Dean grabbed my ankles, my ankles of my pants. I jumped up, and he took off my pants, and I ran out of the room. It was over. Just had a little burn. But it was really one of the most profound experiences, because, you know, I thought, like, for days, ah, I see complete strangers, and I just think to myself, well, you know, I've been on fire. I was on fire. <laughs> you know, there are just some people who really embrace the danger thing. They're not worried about hurting themselves. 
I think that people tend to worry about hurting themselves. And I think that, I think it's a class thing. Like how much, how many feet of protection does who get on earth? How high are their fences? Like the people who are the richest are the furthest away from any kind of penetration. And the poorest people actually, you know, have scars on their face because they can't keep harm away from them. That's Elizabeth Streb. They can't keep harm away from them. My first lecture I talked about, I said that glamour is beauty and violence combined. Some of you responded to that idea, follow-up emails. There is a relationship between beauty and pain and art. Many of you in the audience can discuss that relationship a lot more intelligently than I can. But I do know this. Many American artists have carried the story of tragedy as well as joy and reckonings with truth by mixing struggle and beauty. Beauty is life-saving, Elaine Scarry, from an interview I did of her quoting St. Augustine. Beauty is life-saving, beauty is life-saving. One of my favorite carriers of truth and beauty was the opera diva Jessie Norman. That photograph was also taken by Diana Walker. And this is called Amazing Grace, Jesse Norman. I sing that song all over the world. Everybody in the world knows Amazing Grace. And when I think about the text of Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, it is impossible to think about it without realizing the person who actually wrote these words, without having that person in mind. John Newton was from, that at, was from, at, from what was at that time the United Kingdom, a slave trader caught in a mighty tempest on the ocean, thinking that he might die, and realizing himself what a profession he had. He was asking for that word grace. He was asking to be saved in spite of the awful things that he had done in his life. He still thought that there was a possibility to be saved, that he would perhaps be saved from immediate death in that tempest on the ocean, or that his soul might be saved. Of course, there's a great deal of question as to where the melody uh, sort of is derived. And my feeling is that John Newton, having made more than one trip across the Atlantic and the Horn of Africa, taking people from their homeland to a new land to be enslaved, certainly people in the bowels of a ship had to somehow, and I say this all the time, Anna, that as a people, we have sung our way through things, not sung our way out of them. And so I would have thought, and it certainly has been proven, that the tune of Amazing Grace is much closer to old tunes still found, in, particularly in West Africa. And so the fact that the tune of the song has sort of been given credit to the Welsh and to the Scottish, by the way, that this in my mind simply does not, as it were, hold water. The tune of Amazing Grace could have been an African tune, absolutely, absolutely. The rhythm of it, the length of it, the meter of it is much closer to a West African song than it is to anything that is Welsh or Scottish. But these songs that have been created throughout 
the 17th, 18th, 19th century by the enslaved, that this was a matter of simply getting through the day, not getting out of it, getting through it. Jesse Norman. And both of these photographs were taken by my friend Diana Walker. Beauty as a vehicle for carrying truth and reckoning. How many of you have visited the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, better known as the Lynching Memorial? Applaud so I know if any of you have. Brian Stevenson succeeded in erecting a monument to lynching in Montgomery, Alabama. And when you go, you can right, walk right up two columns. There's a beauty in it. Until you walk up and look closely at each column, which will be labeled with the county in which the lynching took place and the names of the people who were lynched. I went to Montgomery and I interviewed Brian Stevenson. And we met in a room with a wall about as big as this wall and almost as high. And there were these huge jars, like pickle jars, I guess, or maybe even bigger. And they had a kind of a brown, a brown and then colored, even sparkly substance. Stephen, it would be like a, a, an art installation is what it, what it looked like. And we sat in that room and we talked. All of these jars, and this is called injury, injury. All of these jars represent communities where people were lynched. This is just the state of Alabama. Downstairs we have jars from all over the country. And some of these were what we call public spectacle lynchings, where thousands of people came downtown and watched uh, black men, women, and children being burned alive. What we do is we collect all the available information about the lynching, um, and sometimes it's very precise. It's on the courthouse lawn, or it's in the public square. It's at this park. Those places are still recognizable. Some of these lynchings are as recent as, you know, 1949, 1950. Um, other times it's not precise. It's like they took him from the jail, and they took him down the road. And somewhere between mile marker 11 and mile marker 12, he was hanged or he was killed. This is American history. I mean, I don't think what we're doing is African American history. And when I talk about it, I like starting with what happened to the native people because I think we're in a post-genocide society. I think what happened to the native people on this continent was genocide. We killed them by the millions, we slaughtered them, but we didn't call it genocide because we said these native people are different. And that's when this narrative of racial difference really began to take shape. And because we could say that native people are savages and we could create a rhetoric about their diminished humanity, we didn't feel bad um, to abuse them and to kill them and to force them off their lands. And that experience is what I think made American slavery particularly vicious. I think the great evil of American slavery was not involuntary servitude. It was not forced labor. It was this ideology of white supremacy, this idea that black people were not fully human. And that ideology is something that happened to white people, just as it happened to black people. White people actually began to think that they were better than black people. And it has done something really, really corruptive. And there's a way in which you can see the tragedy in this history. Uh, I've been around a lot of people who are in really desperate situations. I did have a case um, not that long ago where we tried to get involved. We tried to stop an execution. And the man was scheduled to be executed in 30 days. And um, I quickly learned that he suffered from intellectual disability our courts have banned the execution of people with intellectual disability. And so we went to the trial court and said, you can't execute him, he's intellectually disabled. 
And the trial court said, no, too late, too late. You should have raised this years ago. When I went to the state court, they said, too late. The appeals court said, too late. The federal court said, too late. Every court I went to said, too late. And we went to the United States Supreme Court, and finally the United States Supreme Court accepted our motion. They reviewed it, and then about an hour before the scheduled execution, the clerk called me and said, yeah, the Supreme Court's going to deny your motion. You're too late. And I got on the phone with this man, and it's the hardest thing that I have to do in my work. And I said, I'm so sorry. But I can't stop this execution. And the man did the thing that I fear the most in this work. He started to cry. And um, within a few minutes, he started to sob. I mean, it's literally 50 minutes before the execution. I'm holding the phone, and this man is just sobbing. And then he said, uh, please don't hang up. There's something important I have to say to you. And he tried to say something to me, but in addition to being intellectually disabled, he had another challenge. When he got nervous, when he got overwhelmed, he would begin to stutter. And he began trying to say something, but he couldn't get his words out. And I think that is the thing that I found just overwhelming because he was trying so hard to get his words out and he couldn't. And he kept trying and he kept trying and he kept, and that's when the tears started running down my face, I was holding the phone. And then he said to me, Mr. Stevenson, I want to thank you for representing me. I want to thank you for fighting for me. And the last thing he said to me was, Mr. Stevenson, I love you for trying to save my life. There was something about that. He hung up the phone. They pulled him away. They strapped him to a gurney. They executed him. And I, I, just, I, I just, you know, I just, I can't, I can't. You know, I was just, you know, I just, I, I mean, there was something about it that just shattered me. And I was thinking about how broken he was, and I just couldn't understand, why do we want to kill broken people? That's one of the things I just don't understand. What is it about us that when we see brokenness, we get angry? We want to hurt it. We want to crush it. We want to kill it. And then I realized all of my clients are broken people. I represent the broken. Everybody I represent has been broken by poverty or disability or addiction or dependency or racism. And then I realized that the system that I work in is a broken system. People with power are unwilling to get close to the people who are suffering. They're locked into these narratives of fear and anger. They've lost their hope. They won't do uncomfortable things or inconvenient things. And at that moment, I said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was sitting there for a while, just thinking. And something said, you better think about what you do if you're not going to do it anymore. And it was in that moment that all of a sudden I realized why I do what I do. And it surprised me. And what I realized is that I don't do what I do because I've been trained as a lawyer. I don't do what I do because it's about human rights. I don't do what I do because if I don't, no one else will. What I realized is that I do what I do because I'm broken too. And that's the discovery. I, I, I don't think that brokenness is something that we necessarily wear. It's much more, um, it's about a consciousness. I don't think it's a bad thing. I actually think it's in brokenness that we understand our need for grace, our need for mercy. It's actually brokenness that helps us appreciate justice. It's in brokenness that we begin to crave redemption, that we understand the power of recovery. It's the broken among us that actually can teach us what it means to be human. Because if you don't 
understand the ways in which you can be broken by poverty or neglect or abuse or violence or suffering or bigotry, then you don't recognize the urgency in overcoming poverty and abuse and neglect and end bigotry. But I think it's the proximity to all of this. I mean, I, I even feel broken by this history. Oh, yeah. When I was a little boy, you know, they, you know, polio shots. They want to give everybody a polio shot. My county, where there was no, uh, there were no doctors, so they made everybody go to a building, which was kind of like a, it wasn't a health center, it was like a big building, and everybody had to get their polio shot. I was like five. And black people had to get in the back, go in the back door. So we line up out back, it was a cold day. And they had little sugar cubes that they were giving the white kids. And by the time they got to the black kids, they ran out of sugar cubes. And the nurses were tired, and they had just lost their capacity to be kind to these little children. And so they were grabbing these black kids and giving them these needles. And my sister was in front of me. And when they, she was next, she was so terrified. And she looked to my mother, and she said, please, Mom, please, please, please don't let them do this. And they grabbed my sister, and they pulled her aside, and they took the needle, and they jabbed it into her arm, and then they came for me. And I remember looking at my mom, and I was the same way. And they pulled me aside, and they were about to jab me. And then all of a sudden, I heard all of this glass breaking. And my sweet, loving mother had gone over to a wall, picked up a table of beakers and glasses, and she was slamming against the wall. And she said, this was not right. She was screaming, this is not right. This is not right. Y'all should not have kept us out here all day. This is not right. And the doctor came running and said, call the police. And there were two black ministers, and they came running over and said, Please, doctor, please, sir, please, 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 please don't call the police. We'll get her out of here. Please, please. One of the ministers fell to his knees. He was just begging. I haven't thought about this in a while. Fell to his knees. And he persuaded them not to call the police uh, to give the other black kids their shots. And so I got my polio shot. They didn't arrest my mom, which I was happy about. But you can't have a memory like that without it creating a kind of injury, a kind of consciousness of wrongfulness a consciousness of hurt. That's what I mean when I say I'm broken, right? I have that in my head. And it means that there has to be recovery. I can't just absorb it. I gotta, I gotta respond to it in some way. Yeah, yeah. It is the weight and its shadows and it burdens, and it, and it, um, and, and it creates a kind of um, um, anxiety that requires a response. And that's the thing about it. I, I just think that a lot of us were taught that you have to find a way to, to silently live with your brokenness. With this injury. With that memory. And I just don't think that's the way forward. I'm looking for ways to, to 
not be silent. Brian Stevenson. Join me in welcoming to the stage Joshua Roman. strong but you needed proof you saw her bathing on the roof her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you she tied you to a kitchen chair she broke your throne and she cut your hair and from your lips she drew the hallelujah Hallelujah, 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 took the name in vain well I don't even know the name but if I did well really what's it to you there's a blaze of light in every word doesn't matter which you heard the holy or the broken heart Didn't my best, it wasn't much. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. I've told the truth, I didn't come to fool you. And 
And even though it all went wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but Joshua, thank you. Thank you. Coming over the crest, we're getting to us, Anita Hill, from an interview that I did of her in the mid-90s, Promises. It was just bizarre yesterday. The first thing I did I went to a place to get a cup of coffee. And the, the woman behind the counter said, what is your name? As though she was interrogating me, as though I was some kind of an imposter. She said, well, I heard that you hadn't lived in Norman for a long time. And so, you know, what I thought was my home, in some ways has been taken away, taken away from me by these myths that go around. So even in the town that I thought was my home, I can't go in and be completely anonymous and completely relax. I still have to deal with the question about who I am and what I'm doing here. I think that home is as much psychological and spiritual as it is physical. To the extent that I'm at peace here now, it's not because this place has fulfilled the promises we thought it would. It's because I have fulfilled the promises and met up to its limitations. Anita Hill. And I'm gonna end where I started four weeks ago with the late Jack Witten's painting, Atopolis, for Edward Glissant. Glissant had been cl a close friend and comrade of Frantz Fanon, but moved from the idea of revolution as a project to what he called the poetics of relation. Quote, the thought of errantry is not apolitical, nor is it inconsistent with the will to identity, which is, after all, nothing other than the search for a freedom within particular surroundings. One who is errant, who is no longer traveler, discoverer, or conqueror, strives to know the totality of the world, yet already knows he will never accomplish this, and knows that is precisely where the threatened beauty of the world resides. And Jack Witten wrote this about this magisterial painting, to quote 
Glenn Lowry at MoMA where I first saw it. A, atopolis, A equals not. Topos equals place. Polis equals city. In Greek, atopy, placelessness. Unclassifiable. A borderless city built from the uprooted, ungrounded, and nomadic destinies of old and new migrants. A fluid identity, unquote. And Witten wrote elsewhere, Ever since white imperialist entrepreneurs forced us into slavery, black identity has been linked to our not having a sense of place. This sense of place for us had to be created through hard work involving all our faculties of being." Unquote. In America, that hard work has been done with courage by individuals who have had to some extent find a way to us. They got to us through one, unique meetings of their meanness and their not meanness. Sometimes there was bloodshed around that meeting, even their bloodshed. Bad intentions compromised to make good intentions, recognizing when good intentions become bad intentions, practicing hospitality, manifesting grace, understanding, as Cory Booker told me, black folks have to resurrect hope every day. And let us now conclude by letting Congressman John Lewis take us home. And this is called Also Amazing Grace. On our way, on this uh, trip, that we've been taking for the past 13 years. I've been going back every year since 1965, back to Selma, to commemorate the anniversary of Blood Asunder. It took place on March 7, 1965. Uh, we usually stop in Birmingham for a day, and then we go to Montgomery for a day, and then we go to Selma. But on this trip to Montgomery, we stop at First Baptist Church, the church that was pastored by Reverend Ralph Abernathy. And it's the same church where I met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Abernathy in the spring of 1958. Young police officer, the chief, came to the church to speak on behalf of the mayor that was not available. And he gave a very moving speech to the audience. The church was full, black, white, Latino, Asian Americans, members of Congress, staffers, family members, children, and grandchildren. And he said, what happened in Montgomery 52 years ago during a freedom ride, when you arrived, was not right. He said, the police department didn't show up. They allowed an angry mob to come and beat you. And he said, Congressman, I'm sorry for what happened. I want to apologize. This is not the Montgomery that we want Montgomery to be. This is not the police department I want to be the chief on. Before any officers are hired, he said, they go through training. They had to study the life of Rosa Parks, the life of Martin Luther King Jr. 
They have to visit the historic sites of the movement. They have to know about what happened in Birmingham and what happened in Montgomery and what happened in Selma. He said, I want you to forgive us. And he said, to show the respect that I have for you, I want to take off my badge and give it to you. This church was so quiet, no one said a word. And I stood up to set the badge and I started crying. I started crying. Everybody in the church started crying. It was not a dry eye in the church. And I said, officer, chief, I cannot accept your badge. Don't you need it? <laughs> and he said, Congressman Lewis, I can get another one. I want you to have my badge. And I took it. And I'm never ever going to forget it. And I'm going to hold on to it forever. But he hugged me. And I hugged him. I cried some more, <laughs> and you had Democrats and Republicans in the church crying. And this young black officer was sitting down. He couldn't even stand. He cried so much like a baby, really. It was the first time that a police officer in any city where I visit, or where I got arrested during the 60s that ever apologized, or I, where I was beaten. It was a moment of grace. It was a moment of reconciliation. And the chief was very young. He hadn't even born 52 years ago. He wasn't even born 52 years ago. So he was offering an apology and to be forgiven on behalf of his, his associates, his colleagues in the past. It's a moment of grace. It means that the, 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 the suffering and the pain that so many people have suffered have been redeemed. And then for the police officer, the chief, to come and apologize <laughs> and ask to be forgiven. It, it, it felt so good and at the same time so freeing and liberating to have this young man come up. He hugged me, he held me, and I felt like, I, I, I felt, I felt I, 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 I'm just one. <laughs> I'm just one of the people, because <laughs> many people were beaten. Yeah, it is. Amazing Grace. Y'all know that song? Amazing Grace. You know that line in there, 
save a wretch like me. And sin a sense we all fallen short. We all just trying to make it. We all searching. Like Dr. King said, we were out to redeem the soul of America. We first had to redeem ourselves. But this message, this act of grace, or the badge, says to me, hold on. Never give up. Never give in. Never lose faith. Keep the faith. Thank you. Chasing that which is not me, chasing that which is me.